Happy International Women's Day. I know, uh, it's March 8th. I'm with this thriver headed to Miami. Benvenido. Miami. Miami. the third leg of our trip crazy how so fast crazy. it's passing started off at the cam conference ended up in boca west palm boca and now miami. and now miami because this superstar here what are huh. you gonna do um speaking at the um, miami breast cancer conference which is an annual conference for breast surgeons radiologists and oncologists from around the country to come and they learn all the latest greatest and what's in pipeline for medicine for us and I'm going to share my story of hope and emphasize the importance of hope and how hope heals. Hope so heals. I'm speaking on behalf of all of us thrivers. I'm also doing a patient track on CDK46 inhibitors. So yeah. I'm so happy she's doing that because like she gets to be our voice of us wanting to talk to all these oncologists and like even me having to face my own oncologist and wishing I could say what she's about to say to like how many? She said a thousand. Thousands of oncologists. Oh Anyways, I'm here to one support and two film. My professional all. vlogger, yes. camera girl. Woo woo. So I'm gonna film the whole thing and you guys get to hear Stephanie speak. Can't wait to get to the Fontainebleau. misdiagnosis and her ongoing journey with metastatic breast cancer, she finds joy and purpose in inspiring others by sharing her experiences and has become involved in multiple philanthropic works and projects. Stephanie learned quickly that there's an unfortunate lack of resources and support, particularly for a young woman with metastatic breast cancer. As a result, she has made this her life's mission. I think you're really going to enjoy meeting her. Please welcome my friend and patient, Stephanie Simon. You're welcome. You're nervous? A little nervous, but I'm really grateful to be speaking in front of an audience of professionals who really dedicated themselves to helping save people like me. So I'm a little nervous and intimidated. I'm not going to lie, but I'm very grateful. If any of these guys send you a bill <laughs> for services today, just don't pay it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so let's, let's get right to you, Stephanie. Thank, okay. First of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And let's talk about your story. Yes. Let's. Go, go to the beginning. Okay, so it's a really crazy long story, but um, in a nutshell, I was 31 when I was diagnosed. Um, I was a teacher in my hometown of Los Angeles, and obviously this diagnosis um, blindsided me. Initially it was a, a stage two diagnosis, but after testing, they had discovered that the cancer had metastasized to my iliac bone, so um, it be automatically became a stage four diagnosis. So obviously, stage four diagnosis, you know, comes with so much fear, and I was, um, and it was devastated. And I quit my job that day, not knowing that I would ever, never return to work again. So um, I, when I had learned it was a um, stage four diagnosis, and it's important to say I was diagnosed as being um, ER positive and HER2 positive. So I had one lumpectomy, which. Um, ended up, it's my first surgery I ever had, and one lumpectomy ended up turning into three surgeries, they needed to clear the margin. So I had three surgeries, then it was time to start treatment. So um, I moved from my hometown of Los Angeles, and I went to um, Manhattan to get treated. And upon arriving to um, my new hospital, you know, I knew that I didn't look good on paper. I looked like, you know, um, I was, you know, one foot in the grave with my medical. 
reports, but I told myself um, in my initial diagnosis going to meet my oncologist that no matter what she had to say, I believed that I was going to beat this, and um, it was something much bigger than myself that gave me this confidence, I must say. But, you know, of course I had my first um, appointment and I had a 15% chance of survival. Uh, one in five women with my diagnosis would live to see five years. So of course I was frightened, but, um, you know, I had a knowingness that I was going to beat this. Um, so I started my treatment protocol, I think at the time I was taking um, Herceptin, Navalbean, Petruzumab uh, wasn't around then yet, and I was taking my hormone blockers, I believe I was on tamoxifen. So for... At that point, the breast cancer was where? Um, in so the iliac bone. I had it in the iliac bone. Um, spots would still light up on the breast, even though I had the lumpectomy. And it was also in my spine. So I had um, a couple of vertebrae that had uh, spots as well. So I was being treated and obviously scanned every few months and everything was stable. You know, there'd be a little progression, little regression, little progression, little regression. And um, it was about two years maybe later, um, after two, three years after being treated on this protocol, that um, I noticed a new growth um, coming back in the same right breast. And it was really aggressive. It was nothing like the first one. I mean, it, it became inflammatory. It was like a monster going out of my chest. I'm sure you are aware of what that looks like, but it started to um, protrude out of my chest. And um, my oncologist at the time was throwing all kinds of different targeted treatments at me for her too. Um, I believe it was TDM1, is that right? TDM1. Um, and nothing was working. Um, she tried a different drug, I forget the name of it, but everything that she was trying wasn't working. All were clearly HER2 targeted things. Yes, correct, HER2 positive. So um, at one point, um, at one appointment, she told me, I'm sorry, uh, Stephanie, my drugs aren't working. So obviously she politely was saying, there's nothing more I can do to you, and this is kind of the end of the road for you. And I 100% didn't believe it was my time to go, and I refused to accept death as my fate. So I, I was living in New Jersey at the time, and I had my first panic attack, which never had a panic attack in my life, but um, all to say that I was so terrified by that panic attack, I spent my entire summer indoors praying and meditating, God, please show me the way to, like, show me my breadcrumbs so I could follow the trail to overcome the circumstances I was up against. And I really am, uh, have a really strong faith, so the signs started to appear and I started to follow. And it all started by reading a book by Dr. Kelly A. Turner called Radical Remission. Someone had suggested I read the book. And basically, she worked in the oncology field, and she had asked all of her colleagues, have you ever seen a case of radical remission? They all said yes. And she said, have you documented it in a medical journal? They all said no. So she said, well, why aren't we following what these patients are doing to overcome stage four, hospice care, et cetera? So in her book, she outlines the nine key factors of what these 100 patients that she interviewed did to overcome their stage four diagnosis and achieve a radical remission. So the one thing, I don't know why, it's God, but the one thing that stuck out to me was Chinese herbs. So I said to myself, I'm gonna find a Chinese herbalist, but what do I have to lose at this point? You know, modern medicine isn't working for me. So I contacted a friend who's really uh, knowledgeable when it comes to um, alternative therapies, and she put me in charge with a doctor, um, Dr. George Wong, and um, he actually used to work at Sloan Kettering. Um, so I contacted George Wong. He said he wasn't seeing new patients. He's elderly, and, but he said, I, you're young and I want to help you, so meet me in Queens tomorrow on a random street corner, and um, I did. So I showed up in Queens, I met him, we went to a little cafe, and to make a really long story short, he started to make these herbal teas for me, and I would take them three times a day. And I was still seeing my oncologist, even though she kind of, you know, showed me the exit door. Let me just, I want to give okay. the audience a little bit of background yes. about George Wong. So New York, I'm sure every major city has a cadre of uh, of, of traditional Chinese medicine doctors or, or something equivalent. So in the late 80s, early 90s, George Wong was my biostatistician uh, at Memorial. He had a PhD in pure, not applied, mathematics from MIT. 
Uh, he was valedictorian of his PhD class from MIT. And George figured out a lot of the mathematics with things like gene, gene amplification. And actually, George had two science papers looking at the amplification of HER2. At some point, he said, I don't want to publish any more papers. And he went back to China, his, his homeland, and for about six years, he studied ancient Chinese herbal medicine and then came back to New York where he was hired by the Mildred Strain Clinic, which was part of Cornell. And George has, has had a, a re relatively high profile, supportive type of, of alternative or complementary medicine practice. But I have to say that he's probably the smartest human being I ever met in my life. And he kept telling the editors of science how they got it wrong. And each time they agreed with him. And so now you've got this incredible intellect linked with 2,000-year-old herbal medicine. So that's George Wong. Yes, my godson. So I started to see Dr. George Wong. I was taking the teas, and he kept telling me, you need to see Patrick Borgen. You need to find Pat Borgen. And I, I, I didn't until like the third time, and I was like, you know what? I've been praying for these signs. Let me just find this Pat Borgen guy. So I, <laughs> thank God I did. So I um, contacted my mom because she would be the only one that think you know, I wasn't crazy leaving my hospital, who essentially told me, pack up your bags anyway. So uh, we walked into Dr. Morgan's office. Um, I was really sick at this point. And um, one of the first things Dr. Morgan said to me when we met is something that I will carry with me forever, and it's hard to not get emotional, but he told me that he believed 10,000% that I was going to beat this, that we were going to beat this, I should say. And to hear those words from somebody like, A, who I had never met, you're the first person in this whole medical world that ever gave me any ounce of hope, that completely renewed my spirit and gave me the, the energy and the fight that I needed to continue on my journey. Um, so obviously, my faith was restored and I wanted to continue seeing um, Dr. Morgan because he believed in me and nobody else believed in me as, as much as I believed in myself. So I would start to see Dr. Morgan prior to my appointments um, at my hospital, and he would give me his advice and kind of be like, well, what's, what's on the agenda? And mm, that doesn't really make sense. So he just said, let me, or actually you had told me to get a biopsy, and I asked my oncologist at the time, can we biopsy this? And I asked her a few times, and she said, that's not necessary, it's not necessary. So one morning, um, Dr. Morgan told me, just be here to call out a chemo, be here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'm going to biopsy this. So I showed up to the office at 9 o'clock in the morning, gave me the biopsy, and a week later um, he emailed me with the results saying that he had emailed my oncologist first and he was also emailing to let me know that um, I am not HER2 positive, I am HER2 negative. So that was when I found out essentially that I was misdiagnosed and on all of the wrong drugs for about four and a half years with stage four metastatic breast cancer. And that was like the hugest blow ever. And at, in that moment, I didn't have time to be angry. It was time to go time. I wanted to save my life. So at that time, we sat down and devised a plan together. And he said, OK, well, do you want to be in New York? Do you want to go home to Los Angeles? And I figured, let me go home to Los Angeles, be closer to family. And I found a new oncologist. Um, he helped me find my oncologist. And they went back and did a fish test. Am I saying that right? So they took the initial tumor that they removed five years prior, they sent it to a master pathologist, came back that from day one I was never HER2 positive, it was very much HER2 negative, so basically my pathology was read wrong, which ultimately affected my life forever. Um, and things got really bad before they got better. Um, the cancer metastasized to both lungs. I had two collapsed lungs. I literally was in a fetal position, I couldn't breathe, I was going every other day to get a thoracentesis. Um, and that would allow me to breathe somewhat, but my lungs were filling up so quickly. Um, so I did my Chinese herbs. I was doing medical cannabis. Um, I have a doctor, he's an MD in Santa Monica, and he told me, take this every hour on the hour and you should see some improvements. And I had started Ibrance uh, a, few, a couple of months prior to this. It had just been approved. It had just I mean, been FDA within approved. Within a month of, of re-biopsying, your locally advanced breast cancer, Ibrance had just 
had been approved. Yes. You were starting on that. Right, because you were suggesting it even prior to it being FDA approved, so we're trying to figure out how we were going to get this drug. So I think it was a combination of that, and, and the morning I was supposed to go, they were going to give me a catheter so I could drain my lungs from home, and I was just like, there's no way I'm going to drain my lungs from home. So the morning that I went to get the catheter, I woke up and I had this you know, epiphany that I'm getting better. I could feel my lungs kind of strengthening. I could breathe a little deeper. So um, very stubborn. They kept telling me to take painkillers. I said, no way. So when I showed up to get the catheter, they said, did you please take the painkiller? I said, no, I didn't, but I want you to do an ultrasound because I feel like I can breathe more. And lo and behold, my lungs were clearer than they were a couple days prior. So they said, okay, well, you obviously have a gauge on your breathing. When you can't breathe, come back again and we'll, um, we'll drain them. And I never went back. And my, my scan after that revealed that my lungs were totally resolved of cancer. So it was like a miracle, essentially. I had cancer all over my lungs, totally collapsed too. My lungs were clear on my next scan, and I believe it was a combination of everything I was doing. And I really strongly believe in the power of the mind over any treatment you could take. And um, I guess that that's my message of hope. And you know, I I guess my biggest takeaway, my biggest message. Um, there's a few points I want to talk about. Is like if you can give your patient the worst case scenario, why can't? you give them the best case scenario. You know, it's like every word that an oncologist or a radiologist or surgeon tells us, we cling on to that word and play on repeat in our minds constantly. So, you know, that one little statistic, you know, and that affects our mind, which I believe affects our healing. So I feel like giving hope can be so healing and I, I can attest to that because Dr. Morgan's hope is what gave me hope and saved my life. Um, and you know, to date, I'm still on my treatment. And so um, let's talk about what you're on today. Sure. I know you had some recent scans that were clear, so congratulations Thank you. on that. Um, so you're still on George Wong's yes. terrible tasting. Terrible tasting. Teas. <laughs> uh, twice a day. Three times a day. Three times a day. Yes. That's brutal. Um, a CDK46 inhibitor. Yes, I brands. I brands, and. Um, I take Arimidex daily, um, I take Lupron, and Spasmodex. So, kind of have a heavy load of treatment, but, you know, I'm just, and I do a ton of I, my diet, and I do a ton of other holistic things and, as well, so I believe I kind of had the winning combination that has allowed me to get to this point in my life. So, so you started to talk about your messages to, to this audience, and certainly maintaining hope, and, um, and not giving up prematurely. Um, it, it's really common and standard to re-biopsy refractory disease or metastatic disease. I don't think what we did was that remarkable. I think it was standard here. Um, but at some point you have to ask yourself why the treatments aren't working. Right. And, and that's all we did. Right. And um, we were clearly mortified as a profession that the original biopsy four years earlier had been misinterpreted. Right, and, and one thing I really like, I don't know who to talk to, but I believe it should be standard of care that when pathologists are assessing your results, like it should be a consensual decision, not just one person decides, okay, she's her too positive because they didn't get an adequate night's sleep or didn't have their morning coffee. I really feel like it should be a decision that's made as a team. You know, you're ultimately delivering a decision that's going to affect someone's life, as did mine. And through advocating for younger women, I um, have learned that this is very common. A lot of young women have come to me. I actually lost a very, very close friend last year, and she was also misdiagnosed. So I think that this is more common than it should be, and maybe you know, incorporating a standard of care where things are triple checked before you know a consensus is made is crucial. Would you mind if we took some questions from Absolutely. our audience? So, Absolutely. As an oncologist who works in the hearts, when you make a mistake, were you, did you ever, well, I'm, I'm, did you ever talk to an oncologist? I mean, a great teachable moment where patients teach us so much. Did you have a chance to speak to friends or speaking to us? Um, no, I, I, I emailed and I never heard back. Um, so I just took that as, and like I said, at the, in that moment I was really sick. 
so my priority was getting home and getting on the right treatment, but I, I emailed and I never heard back, but I do hope that one day I can meet her and say I'm still alive, and I forgive you, like we all make mistakes. It's, it's not, you know, I forgive, I've forgiven her in my heart, and, and we do all make mistakes, but my guess, my message is I would just really like to get the message across that maybe, you know, these, these te really important tests should go through a few set of hands before being delivered. But in answer to your question, no, um, I never heard back from her, but I have, I have forgiven her. Um, were you ever offered um, to purchase your eggs for fertility in the future? For the first time ever, I was told no, that I wasn't going to be able to harvest my eggs. Um, because I had to be on treatment immediately, and that was um, a huge, uh, pill, hard pill for me to swallow because I always wanted to have children. Um, so in the interim of Dr. Morgan telling me I had a few months to get, he gave me three months. He said, okay, you're leaving New York. You have three months to get home, move across country, meet your doctor, and start treatment again. So I, for the first time in my now eight-year journey, I had my three-month window. So. I, by a fluke, I ended up going, so I land home in Los Angeles, my friend takes me to a fertility clinic, I show up to this um, fertility doctor, I'm going over my medical history, he's looking at me like I have three heads, and so he says to me, well, first we need to, um, you need to have a menstrual cycle, and I had just started my first menstrual cycle in years. So I said, well, I, I just started. And he's like, well, it has to be day two. And lo and behold, it was day two. Like, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I literally went, started giving myself the Clomin, is that what it's called, the Clomin injections. And I was able to harvest three eggs. And I did that on a Friday. And I had to go back on Lupin on Monday. So I literally had, like, miraculously this window. And just by fate, it happened that I was able to harvest eggs. So that was a great question. And, I was very blessed to be able to do that, so now I have three babies on ice. <laughs> three babies. Three babies on ice. Um, I have a question on, you talked about having some holistic therapies as well, and traditional therapies, and you mentioned that you have a traditional. And so I was just wondering, since so many times we see how you have down to babies that like that, right? You know, with modern medicine and then more integrated or alternative therapies, how does that work when you're within the modern medicine world of possible things? Do they work together? I kind of had to take the, um, the wheel and, and decide, okay, this is what's working for me, this is what's working for me, and find like the perfect marriage. And I think one thing that people don't talk about is diet, and how could you not address diet? It's like what we put into our bodies is just as equally important as the treatment we're putting into our veins. So I really did a lot of research and cut out a lot of, um, you know, refined sugars, processed foods, I eliminated a lot of meats, and so I really refined my diet um, and did a lot of uh, Chinese herbs and other supplements too. So I really believe that those are the things that sustained me while I was being on, uh, while I was on the wrong drugs. But I did kind of have to navigate on my own and find out. Um, it's hard to find doctors that are open to hear what you're doing, you know. And in my opinion, I think I'd want to know, okay, well you defy the statistics, what are you doing, so. So we're, we're very careful yes. about, about this and, and never, you know, stepping off of evidence-based medicine in favor of treatments that are that are much harder to prove. Um, these are clearly complementary, but they've been around for 2,500 years, and there are very few things around today that are 2,000 year old that, that, that don't have some arguable merit. Uh, George Wong has presented his data uh, on a number of occasions in San Antonio, but because each treatment is completely individualized, it doesn't lend itself to a clinical randomized trial. So you wind up with a lot of case reports. Um, he's done extensive cell line work. I, I can tell you from, from, from watching the traditional Chinese medicine in the, in the clinics, they're extraordinarily potently anti-estrogen. And like a lot of other plant-based therapies that we have in the body, these might be the most potent anti-estrogens that, that we have. So, but we're very, very careful to be both open-minded and cautious. Um, we don't want patients to forego evidence-based proven therapies in favor of these. But when a patient in a stage four setting um, is looking for a best of the East and best of the West approach, we're very, very, very open-minded in that. We also work closely with oncologists to make sure that there are contraindications between a CDK4-6 inhibitor and, and plant-based you know, strategies.
my question is, are they really recommending in the road genetic testing? No, no, it's never been recommended. I actually was interested in it, and um, I think it was the genomic sequencing, is that what it's called? And I inquired about it a few years ago when I had found my new oncologist in Los Angeles, but his answer was kind of like, we don't have time for that right now, we need to start you on treatment. But I'm very interested in it because I think, you know, obviously I believe each cancer is different and to know maybe what my personal mutation is, so maybe a more personalized approach, I think, I feel like medicine's moving in that direction. The, the response to the CDK46 inhibitor was, was beyond dramatic. It was just incredibly striking how quickly the lung disease cleared up and, and, and even the chest wall disease right. just remarkably different and just melted away. Right. And so, but that, that certainly is, is on our radar as well. It's, it's a great point that you're raising. Um, and then there was the lung side to take here. You said one thing that we have not commented on. That is that you spend the summer in your home Right. And I think that we as oncologists sometimes underestimate the importance of spirituality and in my own practice. Uh, this is completely unscientific, but I have found that those patients who have the spirituality always do that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you so I think we have time for one more question. Yes, is there one in the, oh, two more questions, okay. We've used the term today of natural toxicity, and one of the things I think I heard you say was with your diagnosis, you quit your job. Yes. And so how did you manage financially, and especially I know George uh, accepts insurance, and how did you right. solve it? That's Quite a great much. question, because I, I struggle tremendously financially. Um, I haven't been able to work, and like I said, I was a teacher, so I was on, um, I did receive some uh, leave or medical aid, but then I was forced to go on to Social Security, which then gave me Medicare, and thankfully Medicare is accepted most places, but I haven't been able to work, so I've been trying to find ways to make income, but I can't make too much income or they'll take away my, um, my stipend that I get every month. And, Dr. Wong does not take Medicare. Thankfully, I have a father who helps me, but you know that that is a huge concern of mine. Like, how it's it's about. I'm, I'm correct me if I'm wrong. Right. I think it's about ten dollars a day. It's about three hundred dollars a day. Yeah, month. Is exactly. That fair? Yeah, about three to four hundred, depending on what ingredients he uses. Yeah. Um, but little endeavors I have. I, uh, I have a company that I make jewelry with my friend, my best friend, and. My friend Nally and I are um, co-authoring a book called The Thriver's Guide, which Dr. Morgan will um, help us write the forward. So I'm trying to find creative ways to make money, but um, with the ultimate goal of inspiring other women with my message um, to never lose hope. I want to, again, uh, thank Stephanie uh, for being courageous enough to stand up in a room full of a thousand people and share a very personal uh, at times painful story. So please join me in thanking Stephanie Sagan. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I feel grateful to be here in front of all of you. So thank you. Thank you guys. Enjoy your lunch. How was Stephanie's talk? I thought it was excellent. She hit on every single point she needed to discuss about how important it is to really have that healthy patient-doctor relationship and to really, you know, what else is out there that we can do besides doing the chemotherapy, besides doing the medications, like health and wellness and, you know, whether it's diet or, you know, brain and it's just, you know, the wholesome whole, like, you know, the fact that she said, check my lungs again, I feel that they're clear. And they checked her lungs, and lo and behold, they were clear. So it's like, she's like in tuned with, not even just like mentally, but it's like physically and spiritually. I think it was just, it was just, it was awesome to be here and just witness that. I think she did amazing as expected. And I think my probably most favorite part when she talked about the doctors giving their patients hope and how important it is to not just give them the worst case scenario but also the best case scenario and how like they when you when you hear words from your doctor that you take it home with you and you think about it over and over and over again and just that little bit of hope 
especially that the hope that Dr. Gorgon gave her felt like it was like life changing. So that's yeah. probably my favorite point. And Mandy's been there for Stephanie. Yes, the and whole I, journey. I actually remember, like, I think she calls me the day or the day after she talked to Dr. Gorgon, and I could just, I could just hear it in her voice. It was just like she, she found her healer. You know, so amazing. Amazing.